The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 28, seems to declare that in Christ, racial, national, sexual, gender, as well as class divisions are neither divisive nor degraded. Yet, in both the church and society, it seems like white males have privilege and power over other individuals. Today's show will focus on how Christian ministers are seeking to transform white male privilege in themselves, the church, and society. Please stay tuned. Welcome to Perspectives of Faith and Culture. I'm Karen Crozier. Today joining me are two Christian ministers. The first one we have is Phil Skye, who is the pastor on, on, of Owen Rapp's Covenant Church. Welcome, Phil, to the show. Thanks, Karen. You're welcome. Our second guest is Pastor Norman Broadbent, who is senior minister of the First Congregational Church, or the Big Red Church. Right. Welcome, Thank Norman, you. to the show. Gentlemen, as we have this conversation on this very critical issue, the way that Paul has been interpreted, misinterpreted, appropriate, or misappropriated, please share from your experience how this text has been understood from your leadership role as a minister. Pastor Phil. Yeah, I mean, so, so I'd agree. I mean, I think that, that in many cases, uh, Paul has been sort of misunderstood. Um, so I hear a lot of uh, pastors talk about um, you know I the function of the pastor uh, in a uh, from the pulpit is to preach Christ crucified and him alone right and uh, and then they go to this to this Galatians passage and so it's a little troubling because um, that usually is is something that I hear from white pastors and ministers so what it suggests and then you know what it suggests is that race doesn't matter anymore uh, ethnicity doesn't matter anymore once you become a follower of Jesus. Uh, but you know what then is your experience uh, day to day? Uh, and so the reality is that there is a chasm, there's a disconnect between our experience and the gospel that we're preaching if we are interpreting Paul uh, in the way in which I just suggested. Uh, I don't think that's the way it is. Uh, I think that, that Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 5, he talks about the, the ministry of reconciliation. And so for me, uh, you know, really what this means is that, is that we live out, if, if God has reconciled all things to himself, all things to himself, uh, and he has given us that ministry here on earth, that then we live that out. And so everywhere that we are, we are living out this, this reconciliatory work, um, whether it be class or gender or generation or whatever, um, and in this case, we're talking about ethnicity. So it's, it's a huge issue. So when you say Paul is not referring to this, uh, can you clarify what do you mean by this? This is not the case of the way that ministers are preaching it. And what is Paul actually saying in your perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we talk about, uh, you know, when Paul says that, that in Christ there is neither, neither male nor female, Jew or Greek, slave or free, um, you know, we often interpret that as, uh, you could say then, right, based upon this, this logic that I hear a lot of folks sort of espouse, is that, that then, well, gender doesn't matter either once you become uh, a follower of Jesus. I mean, men, women, doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Uh, and I, I would disagree with that. I think that diversity comes from God, actually. So in the beginning, right, God creates, you know, the heavens and the earth, and he creates a diversity of trees, and he creates land, and he creates water. Diversity. He creates male and he creates female. Diversity. This is God's design. Diversity is. But, but, but the challenge then is that, so in the beginning, in Genesis 1 and 2, uh, that diversity lives in harmony, right? Uh, but then sin enters the world, and now the diversity creates competition, Cain and Abel, right? And so now it's not harmony. Now it's you're my competitor, you're my enemy. Uh, and so now the rest of this world and, and society today is, is living out of that narrative in a lot of ways. And that's where white privilege has ultimately kind of found its roots. It is about sort of survival of the fittest and that myth. Um, 
And so the, the ministry of reconciliation then is to embrace diversity. It's God's idea. But the, w the reconciliatory work is where we are bringing back together and learning how to live again in harmony. And that's done through, through Jesus. It's how, we, it's how we experience that. Thank you. Norman, from your perspective, how have you experienced? Would you see, uh, do you see what Pastor Phil is identifying as far as the conflict or the tensions of how people just want to say it doesn't matter anymore, but yet here we are in our different uh, created being itself, be, beings. How do you experience and observe this passage in your ministry? Yeah, m much, of, much of what you said, Phil, are things that I would, I would reinforce. But I would, but I would also my my beginning point would be a slightly different um, point of departure. Um, these words from Galatians and elsewhere, where where Paul makes reference to this this apparent um, breakdown of traditional divisions, um, those are words that that a lot of people have taken to heart and have used to justify their their own particular filters. But unfortunately, they've not followed where their heart should lead them. <laughs> And I think that that's, that's, that's part of the issue that we have when we deal with the questions of white privilege. White, white privilege um, and white male privilege I would break down into, into separate categories. You have, you have male privilege, um, which historically in the life of the church has been defined in terms of uh, defining who is able to be the apostle, who is able to be ordained in carrying out the mission and the work of the body of Christ. And then you have white privilege, which is defined largely in terms of a European-based um, construct. And so those, those are two very different kinds of beginning uh, realities or, or, or contextual uh, frames for us through which we then begin to, to filter. Um, I, in the work that I've done through, through the churches, I always uh, preach context, context, context that when Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, as he is writing to the other churches through his letters, Paul is not living outside of history. Paul is living very much within the context of the history of his time and place. And so in part to appreciate what he is saying in these particular verses in Galatia, it's, I think is somewhat helpful to understand the context of, of where the Galatian church was. I think most of us would be surprised to learn that Galatia, which is in modern-day Turkey, is actually one of the regions in Turkey that had been settled by immigrant Celts. You think of Celts primarily in Ireland and Scotland, but here was a region in Turkey that had been settled as early as 270 of, before the Common Era by, by a very different culture and tradition, it became very, very tribal, as distinctive from the other communities in that part of the Mediterranean world. They, over time, assimilated and adapted um, other religious traditions so that they had in place a way of responding to the world of their time that was very, very clearly defined by certain rigid rules as to who had authority and who didn't. So when Paul writes these letters to this church that, that in itself is an, an anomaly to the region, we have to ask the question, well, what was he expecting them to hear? And it's interesting in taking this passage that he is looking at a point of contrasts, uh, Jew and Gentile. This is at a time in which uh, those kinds of distinctions were not filtered the same way we today filter it in terms of nation states. This was much more of a tribal context. When he talks about free or slave, Paul literally is addressing an economic structure. When he's talking about, in his history, maybe it's a play on words somewhat, but in the Galatians passage, he doesn't speak of male nor female. He speaks of male and female. So that there is a dichotomy that is, that is actually derivative of, of the Genesis. Let us make male and female in our own image. So what, I, what I'm suggesting is that our, our contemporary filters, and in particular the filters that have come to us from the period of the Reformation on, have defined our interpretation of Paul 
according to what our context is. And we somehow miss the nuance of what Paul is talking about, which is where I think, where, where I would find real concord with what you're saying, is Paul is not talking about obliterating the distinctions. He's talking about creating a new community in which those distinctions no longer can be used against one another. They have to be used in shared, in what is community? But mutual Koinonia. support and neutral. The koinonia, right. precisely. That's so that's a, that's a bit of an expanded interpretation, but I hope it gets to... Yes, you sort of uh, sent us forward to question number two uh, as we look at defining what constitutes white male privilege. You sort of brought it up within the context within the church around uh, gender or maleness privilege is that men get the opportunity to determine who and who gets ordained, when they get ordained, and those who's excluded from being ordained. I, as a female, had that experience in my earlier yeah. upbringing. Yeah. But when we look at uh, the European context that you indicated as well, how do we really see in both the church and society, because in this country, the United States of America, women were not included in the Constitution of the United States as people who were able to vote. And so we see in both the church and society this white male privilege dominating. So how would you explain white male privilege from your experience, Pastor Yeah, Phil? yeah. So I, I, I think, um, you know, a couple of things. So there's this, so there's this idea that, that, that drives uh, much of the American narrative concerning a, a ladder Right, and so the, the idea of being American is to climb a ladder. Uh, and every rung of that ladder uh, represents new opportunity, uh, new resource, new privilege. Um, that's, you know, that's okay. Uh, but the trouble with this uh, is that, you know, so let's just talk about Fresno. So, so in this city, uh, if, if we are all climbing this ladder, right, and, and, and Paul talks about it, but, but in American history, um, white folks generally uh, started six or seven or 12 or 22 rungs above non-whites in this country. So, so that's, that's an advantage uh, if you're going to climb. Um, and, and so what, what we find then is in, in church contexts, we find that oftentimes, not always, but often, um, white churches uh, often have, because they are made comprised of people who have climbed higher on the ladder more quickly and been there longer, um, we find a lot more resource. Uh, we find that uh, in these churches that um, uh, the folks uh, come from other uh, parts of, of the city uh, where the children are receiving higher quality education. Uh, it's oftentimes more homogenous in terms of ethnicity. Um, there, I'm going to have to interrupt yep. you at this time because we're going to have to take a break. Yep. And we will come back to the response to that question as you give a very elaborate definition of what constitutes white male privilege. We're going to take a break. We'll see you shortly. KNXC thanks all its loyal viewers and respected businesses who have supported your Catholic television station. Now you can support KNXT with program underwriting by having your name, your company's name, or organization associated with your favorite program. Detailed information about you or your company will appear before and after each program or day part you select. Keep the quality and spiritual message alive and make a difference. Call 559-488-7440 today or go online at knxt.tv to find out more about program underwriting on KNXT. Welcome back to the show. Today we are talking about peacemaking and white male privilege and seeing how Christian ministers are engaging this critical issue, wounds and needs in our society and church. Pastor Phil, we left off with you sharing about white male privilege. Could you please pick up um, and given a framework of understanding what constitutes white male privilege. Sure, so cutting to the chase, I mean, here's the point. Is that it, white, the, the, the concept of white male privilege suggests that being white and being male affords you certain privileges, affords you access to certain things in our society and even in the church. Um, that others who are not white and not male 
don't necessarily have access to and don't necessarily have by way of privilege. So you see that across society, we see that in our educational system, we see that in our neighborhoods, we see that in terms of the way in which governments uh, govern, uh, we see that uh, and also in the church. So I mean that's, that's basically the, the concept um, and you know obviously there's to start talking about the history of that but, but that's ultimately where we end up. Thank you. Pastor Norman, what would you like to add or uh, accentuate in that definition that Pastor Bill has think, given think us? I think just in, in the most simple framing of this is that, is that privilege and, and white privilege is something that is conferred. Um, it's not something that you and I can seize. I go back to your illustration of our own constitutional framing, is that who was it that was conferred with power and authority? Um, it happened to be white males. Um, people of color were not included except on fractional basis. Women were not included. And so, so privilege always is something that is conferred, but it's never something I can necessarily seize for myself. It's the way that society accommodates a certain core of people. Um, that, that's, that's basically what I would add to the, to the previous discussion that Phil gave. Right, so two things emerge in that. That is conferred. It has nothing to do with who you are inherently. Precisely. It's not based upon, quote, Precisely. unquote, merits are your work. So now we're looking back at faith. So it's something that's given to you that you didn't even have to work for sure. and there's something that's taken away from people that they didn't have to just because of the color of their skin or their gender or their class. And so when we look at this very dynamic being played out in both the church and society, name a theological framework that informs you in responding to the such critical issues and wounds. I'm going to start with Pastor Norman. What is Jesus talks about the kingdom of God to show God's uh, radical inclusivity of those who were totally marginalized. And Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of the beloved community. What is your framework? Well, my, my framework is the framework that was given to me, which is Jesus' reference to the kingdom of God. And he always referenced the kingdom of God as like and then gave illustrations, sort of living, uh, living in the moment illustrations. The kingdom of God is among you. It's, it's relational. The kingdom of God is one in which, um, I, I like the work of Clarence Jordan from back, back in the day, you know, who talks about the fact that Jesus really wasn't a carpenter. Uh, theologically, uh, he was a farmer. Farmers plant demonstration plots to show which crops will grow most healthily alongside one another. And when he created his community, his disciples, it was a demonstration plot with a Matthew the tax collector and a Judas the zealot. And that, that planting them and seeing how they interact together can create community, which is the beloved community. That is further played out by the, by the repetitive stories told by the various gospel writers of Jesus' interaction with people who are outside of the traditional Judean community. The completely um, um, open discussion of people who are Samaritans, people who culturally, religiously, and socially are outside of the Judean frame, which was the temple culture, which was the predominant religious community with which Jesus would have related in, in his time. And so the kingdom of, of, of God becomes the theological frame in which the distinctions are not wiped away. The distinctions are utilized in such a way as to create a new reality, a new interrelating community of meaning and reality, hence justice. So we don't have to be fearful of our sister and brother who doesn't be. look like us, yeah. nor be hateful of Precisely. him. Precisely. But yeah. we are creating this new way new of be, being yeah. with one another. Yeah. Pastor Phil, what is the theological framework that informs you in your work as a minister? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the kingdom of God. So, so like Pastor Norman, it's, it's, it's the same thing. So it's the, it's the idea of, so you know, scholars agree that the kingdom of God is best characterized by the Hebrew word shalom. Uh, and there are many definitions for this that, that work, I think, fine. Um, you know, the one that I often use is uh, shalom, meaning that uh, things are um, the way they ought to be in us, 
for us and between us all. So if that is the characterization, if that is the character of the kingdom of God, um, then you know, then all of my work, everything the church does, every every how I live as a neighbor in my neighborhood, uh, ought to be an outpouring or an outflow of of the way things ought to be in us, for us, and between us all. Thank you. And one of the things that you said most biblical scholars agree, there are some women scholars, both white and non-white, that have a serious problem with the kingdom of God language because of the ways it's been misappropriated in an abusive matter. And they drop the G to say the kingdom, kingdom. of God to emphasize the relational. And that's what you both are sharing underneath that. Mm -hmm. It is a truly relational transformative and transgressing those boundaries that keep us separated from one another. But when we look at our specific ministries, what is happening? What have been some of your challenges in living out your theology in contexts that want to shun your theology because they want to maintain this white male privileged stature? Pastor Phil, would you please share? Yeah, I mean, so I, so back to something Pastor Norman said earlier that that um, that that I appreciate, uh, and I would just push a little bit further, and that I I think that privilege, yes, it's conferred, but I think that that at least in our society, and we find this, um, that that we almost we uh, those that are in power set up the systems to ensure that that privilege is conferred back to us over time. So so it's almost this. You know, it's a, it's a it's a no win game if you if you didn't set up the system in some ways. Um, that strong language, but 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 that's in essence what I see in often cases. So so in my neighborhood uh, and where where our parish is, you know, really what I see is it's a challenge of people looking to those who they have seen in power and have conferred that power to. Uh, how then does reconciliation work in those settings? Well, for us, you know, it's always about empowerment. Right, and it is about you know Jesus' way of leadership is not climbing up the ladder; it's climbing down the ladder. That's sort of his definition of leadership: is that I, I wash your feet. That's how this works. Um, and so for us, you know, it's 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 an, it's me uh, who is a white male, uh, you know, continuing uh, to to serve everyone around me, right, and make sure that no one sees me as higher than them because that's the way in which sort of the world's been set up. That's the, that's the narrative that's been told and they, they've embraced in many cases. Uh, and then two, it, giving away every bit of power I have uh, to others. Again, Jesus' model of ministry, right, is that, is that I'm sending you and I'm giving you the power to do whatever you need to do. So. so in the moving down, would you suggest that as well for a pastor who is non-white and male? Uh, yeah, I think it's the model, Jesus model of ministry across the board. I think it's always the challenge of, of those who have any power or privilege. So I, I think we all, most of us, have some form of power or privilege if you, if you, if you zoom in far enough, right? So what it might be just might be in your family. It might be in your neighborhood. It might be on your block. It doesn't matter. Uh, wherever there is power or privilege, wherever you have access and someone else doesn't, it's always the model of moving down. And so, uh, Pastor Norman, how would you respond to your particular challenges in that process. Well, similarly, and you and I have had this conversation in other settings about developing a theology of relinquishment, <laughs> which is what you were just describing. Um, you know, I I see it in in various in various aspects. Um, I think it has to do with the particular model constructs that we have that 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 manage just the way operationally we work. For example, Robert's Rules of Order. How many times do church meetings gather around Robert's Rules of Order? And of course, we have to have some decorum and some process. But it is also one that is very determinative of who has the power and the authority. I've seen increasingly churches that have embraced a much more inclusive stance to move towards more of a collaborative decision-making process. There are very specific models that we can use that deconstruct the notion of privilege as to who holds the power and a giving, stepping back and a relinquishing of that to a whole other kind of decision-making process that creates community. Um, the whole process of arriving at consensus is about a community process. It's a tribal wisdom process. Um, and I, I think that 
you know, aside from the very specifics of biology and gender and so forth, those kinds of processes speak to this ability to relinquish and to model and to demonstrate how the realm of God might best be lived out. Right. One of the things that Pastor Field indicated that we have power in different types of contexts. However, white male privilege, as a non-white female, I would need to find my sense of power in Christ as opposed to relinquish it because of the ways I have been dismissed and how is God or the Spirit empowering me. So it would take on a nuance uh, a different con in different contexts where I don't have power, then how do I claim the power of God and where I have been conferred that power by society that doesn't come from God, that's where we are descending as I understand uh, the spirit of the gospel and how Jesus lived and taught. Well, in light of this conversation, we sort of hit on it. What do white males need to do to continue to do the internal work as ministers, as leaders in the, both the church and society who confess Jesus as Christ. Pastor Norman, we'll begin with you. 30 seconds or less. 30 seconds, 30 or, seconds less. or less. 30 seconds or less. I go back to my opening statement that, that you know, we, took, we take to heart the words of Paul, but do we go where our heart should lead us? And I think that, that that's the work of, and the, and the idea of the distinction between being aware of and internalizing. And I think that happens only as we enter into conversations such as this. It always begins in the conversation and in the awareness that leads to an ability to internalize. Thank you. Pastor Phil. Yeah, I, I, I think, well said. I think that uh, white men generally are pretty unaware of their white male privilege, to be honest with you. I think we are. Um, and so, you know, my sort of response is, one, you have to become aware of it, right? And then, and, and the way in which I most often encourage folks to do that is, is to just continue to put yourself in, in relationship and in places, contexts, where you don't have the privilege. Uh, and then, and, and so you lay it down. Stop, stop picking it back up. Lay it down. Don't accept it. And then remain in those contexts over and over and over again until you are able to internalize it and then begin to live out of a different paradigm. Well, thank you, pastors, for your time and contribution on thank today's you. show. And viewers, thank you for watching today. If you have missed any or part of the show, you can see it on YouTube at knxt.tv. Thank you for watching. Take care and God bless.